So this talk is going to focus on a story that connects a debate in science and some debates in policy. Uh, the debate in science is around thinking about range ecology and the so-called new range ecology. And the debate in policy is thinking about land degradation and desertification and the connections between the two. And during the talk I want to uh, demonstrate very quickly some of the, the key debates in and around the so-called new range ecology um, without going into a huge amount of the technical details and then link that to debates, current debates around uh, how dry land uh, environmental change is, is thought about. So the first slide is a picture of the rainfall pattern in Lodwa, northern Kenya, and the deviation from the long-term mean. Now, if you took a picture or a, a presented a graph of virtually any place that you are working in, it would look similar-ish, highly variable. Um, if you were thinking about a montane system, such as in, in uh, Tibet, these peaks and troughs might be snow events. So what we're looking at is, is high variability in the ecosystem and high variability in the key factor, in this case rainfall, that affects primary production, the growth of grass. And the growth of grass uh, affects secondary production, which is the growth of animals. So high levels of variability have some very basic implications. And this was, in a, in a sense, the debate that happened way back, actually, from the 1970s um, in ecology and in rangeland ecology in particular. So there were people like Emmanuel Neumann, uh, people like Stephen Sanford, a variety of people who uh, presented the argument that in highly variable dry land systems in particular, um, the normal assumptions about what was called Clementsian succession, the sort of basic uh, stable change of how vegetation occurs, doesn't necessarily apply. And this came to a head in a, in, in a debate in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when particularly following from a set of papers by uh, Jim Ellis and colleagues who'd worked in northern Kenya, a long-term study in Turkana looking at the relationship between rangelands and livestock. And their, their classic paper of 1988 provoked a big debate. It was not a new debate in ecology, but it was a big debate for rangeland management. And what Jim and others uh, argued is that if rainfall variation, the coefficient of variation of rainfall was, it was somewhere above 33%, this was a non-equilibrium environment. And I'll explain what that, uh, the implications of that. Now, this, was, this all blew up fairly soon after, or during the time I was, I was doing my PhD. And I'll come back to, to how I got engaged with this again through my PhD. But the, at the end, uh, we convened a number of, uh, of events and discussions to try and think about the implications of this for pastoralism. Um, and the book that you, that's up there on the screen, um, uh, range, uh, Rangeland Ecology at Disequilibrium and the follow-on uh, Living with Uncertainty that you have heard about many, many times, um, both were attempts to try and link ecological debates that have been going on for a while with development debates around pastoralism. And to some extent, it had an impact, or an impact in certain quarters. Um, people refer back to this debate about, about new range ecology and so on, um, uh, have referred back to it ever since. So a number of people, these are, these are some examples of some recent papers have tried to analyze, well, where is it in the world that uh, rainfall variation does exceed 33%? And in the red on this uh, diagram, um, these are some of the areas, some of the big areas indeed where pastoralism uh, exists. But there are also boundary areas where 
rainfall variation isn't all isn't on average above 33 percent but but uh, uh, there is high levels of variability as I say there is another debate uh, within uh, montane pastoral systems where snowfall or snow events become the key factor in affecting uh, variability in available uh, forage the next slide is from the same group uh, working with NOAA satellite imagery uh, mapped out this in relation to, to land use and uh, sort of economic use of land. And again, you can see the overlap between uh, so-called non-equilibrium um, environments and, and pastoralism. Uh, and they divide this slightly un helpfully, I think, between so-called subsistence rangeland use and commercial rangeland use. So this debate has been running now for, what, 25, nearly 30 years, if not more, and uh, where, what do we actually then mean by non-equilibrium ecology? There's been huge amounts of literature on this since the early 90s, and you only have to Google to find thesis after thesis and paper after paper debating whether such and such a place is equilibrium and not, or non-equilibrium and whether uh, what this means for, for rangeland management. Uh, quite a lot of that debate, in my view, actually didn't go very far um, and slightly missed the point, and I'll come back to, what, to, to, to why that is. But there have been some good summaries and big reviews that emerged out of the early book, Range Ecology at Disequilibrium, which was published in 93, following a, a meeting in 1991. Susie Vetter, in the uh, paper or collection that was produced in 2004, five or thereabouts in the bottom left, um, did a very useful job in summarizing some of the thinking that had happened 10 years uh, on. Uh, more recently, Robin Reed and colleagues at uh, Colorado State University did a nice uh, annual review um, piece uh, in the top right there, um, thinking about where had this debate got to globally. And a great big chunky book um, at the bottom right by Brisk and uh, et al., David Brisk and, and others, um, uh, again provided a summary of where some of the debate had got to. But the basic argument about non-equilibrium systems goes more or less as follows, and the diagram on the right is, uh, is taken from the Ellis and Swift uh, work, and we reproduced it again in the Rangeland Ecology at Disequilibrium book. And basically it says the, re the relationship between vegetation response and livestock response in non-equilibrium settings is such that uh, the uh, growth of herds, the process of recovery, as you see moving from uh, left to right in this diagram, uh, only gets so far because uh, episodic droughts and, and other events that are either sequential or single year knock that livestock population back. So then they, a, a multi-year drought comes along and the livestock population shoots back to a low level. It gradually recovers and then it comes back again. And if you look in pastoral systems, in dryland areas, you see this pattern. Uh, up and down, up and down, slightly out of phase with the uh, rainfall figures that you that I mentioned before. And those of us working in dryland pastoral areas say, well, yeah, of course that's the case. But what are the implications of that for range management? They're quite profound, because range management as a science, or an applied management science, were evolved particularly in the United States in very stable equilibrium rangelands. This is where Clementsian succession, patterns of vegetation change in relation to livestock pressure, was, was just normal. And out of conventional uh, rangeland management came you know, all the classic uh, textbooks, Stoddart and Bob 
textbooks and you know all the classic rangeland management textbooks that are still used, still taught in Africa, produced in the 60s and 70s, which said basically you have to manage stocking rate uh, in relation to carrying capacities in order to gain maximum um, weight gain for your animals. Now that assumes that um, the stocking rate and the relationship between the number of animals and the rangelands can be is managed because uh, it's in equilibrium. In other words, in ecological terms, density dependent selection is happening on the population, and they're being hit down not by uh, regular or irregular abiotic events. Um, abiotic meaning not part of the um, animal plant system, but external events like rainfall or uh, snow events or things like that. But they are actually as a result of competition between the animals for fighting for gra available grazing. So you have in ecology these two streams of, of understanding of population ecology, density dependent regulation and density independent regulation. Density dependent regulation happening when animals are fighting over available scarce grazing. Density independent when they're getting hit down, the population's getting hit, hit down regularly by drought or other events. And these are two very different ways of understanding a system, very different, because in the if it's density independent regulation in a non-equilibrium system, you get the pattern that you see uh, in the diagram on the slide. Normal carrying capacity, ecological carrying capacity, is never reached under that setting. So actually stocking rates, carrying capacity, all these central tenets of rangeland management don't apply. Oh my goodness, what do you do? Well, you have to think about different management systems, and this is why the debate about so-called opportunistic management and, and so on um, have come into, into the debate. So it is important to think about what are the underlying system properties of the ecosystem on which people, people and livestock are surviving. There's a quote from the Rangeland at this equilibrium book here, um, which should have tried to encapsulate our understanding at that time of the, non of the implications of the non-equilibrium uh, system for pastoralists. The producer's strategy within non-equilibrium systems is to move livestock sequentially across a series of environments, exploiting optimal periods in each area they use. Herd management must aim at responding to alternate periods of high and low productivity with an emphasis on exploiting environmental heterogeneity rather than attempting to manipulate the environment to maximize stability and uniformity. In other words, you have to move, you have to, to, to make use of the variability, you have to live off it, um, rather than trying to control the environment or the livestock population, uh, the, the range environment or the livestock population through classic rangeland interventions. So it's quite a radical uh, affront to rangeland management and a lot of the debate we've had since then has been, well, where does this apply to, to what extent, and so on and so forth. Now, there was another dimension to the earlier argument, which focused not just on, on rainfall variability, but spatial variability of available nutrients, which affects the, the nature of the grasslands. And this is a diagram art from... Bell and others, um, way back from the 1980s, which was a, an attempt to look at, um, at how available nutrients and available moisture affected the nature of savannas. And again, it's a simple two by two. Um, we're taking the top left-hand corner, where nutrients are limited, but rainfall's good, you often get quite poor quality but quite resilient grassland. This is what in ecology is called a dystrophic um, system. A dystrophic system is different from the bottom right hand corner which is an eutrophic system where nutrients are high but rainfall is poor and variable. And in those situations the grassland can be quite high quality, lots of nutrients, creates protein in the grass, um, but actually the rainfall is so poor that there's high variability in the availability of that fodder. So you've got a trade-off between 
for the quality and for the quantity. And I'm sure we will come back to this in, a, in, in the talk on fodder um, next. Now, my PhD study, I said I'd come back to my PhD study, was about um, trying to understand livestock ecology and economy in southern Zimbabwe, which had a number of these different types of, of ecosystem within the study area. And I spent a huge amount of time in my PhD following cattle with herd boys, uh, trailing around, finding out what they ate, where they went, and what they did, um, and how herding uh, affected the, uh, the uh, livestock productivity, but also um, the way the environment was used. And basically, in my study area, I had both dystrophic savanna and eutrophic savanna. And depending on the type of rainfall in each year, people move between different parts of it. And they would move seasonally between different parts. So it's not only the, ra the, the extensive rainfall variability interannually, that earlier graph that I showed you from Lodwa and Turkana, but it's the spatial patterning of ecosystems that affects how animals and people are able to use that environment. Now, every environment is different. Sometimes it's very uniform in one of those quadrants. Sometimes it's, it's uh, mixtures of, of the two. But what I learned from my study is, is this, this dynamic is really, really important. I also learned, and that's you know, the chapter in that original book, comes from my thesis, um, I also learned that the, the dynamics of, of E the, the equilibrium non equilibrium debate was highly relevant in this setting. This wasn't a classic non equilibrium environment. It wasn't so dry that it was, a, and so highly variable rainfall. It was somewhere in the middle. Rainfall varied between about 400 millimeters per annum to about 800. So it was, and the coefficient of variation, if I remember rightly, was in, was sort of 20% rather than 33%. So what was interesting there is that it was neither in the equilibrium camp, if you like, or the disequilibrium camp. It was somewhere in between. And I think a lot of pastoral environments, almost by necessity, are of that sort. Lane Kopok and the, cl the crew that worked with Solomon Dester and others that worked in Burana in Ethiopia made exactly the same point. Um, it was a very similar type of environment. So the, as it were, the binary opposition of equilibrium versus non-equilibrium was helpful to some degree to raise the bigger debate. But as the debate emerged and as we became, there was more empirical data that emerged from different places, it became a little bit more nuanced. One of the most important nuances, in my view, um, is the uh, importance of thinking about spatial heterogeneity and the importance of patches or key resources. Because rain, uh, rangelands are not uniform, far from it, um, highly variable. And there are particular sites within a, within a rangeland setting where there are what one might call dry season grazing patches, the last place uh, the animals go to in the dry season to keep them alive before the next rains when a new flush of grasses come. So where are these places and what are they? Because they can be quite small. They can be a small pan, they can be a, a valley bottom land, they can be an edge, a strip on the edge of the river. Um, the, the names at the, on the slide are names for, for what, in an, a project that I was involved in way back, we call wetlands in drylands, trying to understand where are these relatively productive places which have slightly higher moisture, slightly better nutrients that provide just that fodder that keeps animals alive at the end of the, the season. Same applies in in winter pastures, summer pastures, that type of dynamic. You see the same, the same issue. The important point about this is that these are the places where often the so-called density dependent regulation of animal populations occurs. If you have all the animals from an area packed into one little, little spot, it's, it's actually going to be competition over available resources, not density independent regulation. So it's going to happen, these patterns happen 
spatially as well as temporally, and that becomes really important. And there was quite a debate in the late 90s, early 2000s, whether, whether thinking about this actually threw out the whole idea of non-equilibrium rangelands. Actually, uh, wasn't actually all of this about equilibrium systems, but in a spatially variegated sense. I don't think that's the case, because actually what you see in these systems, if you look spatially, um, is small patches and wide expanses of what are effectively non-equilibrium systems. Um, poor avail available forage, often of low quality, where people, uh, where people and animals are going to have to move around. And these patches then become crucial. And I'll explain why this becomes especially so uh, in a minute. And it's often the ratio between key resources and the wider um, system that then becomes vital in understanding that ecology. So the non-equilibrium, equilibrium debate and all of that stuff in rangeland ecology happened largely in a context where we were thinking of as it were so-called traditional nomadic transhuman pastoral systems and as we've discussed in previous talks this is not the case anymore and probably wasn't much the case in many places, even in the early 90s, late 1980s. Pastoral systems are changing. So what happens when you import fodder from outside into a non-equilibrium system? Changes it dramatically. What happens when you drill boreholes that create available water uh, in a non-equilibrium system and offset the drought effects of, um, of variable rainfall? Well, obviously that dynamic that earlier diagram that I, I showed is not going to happen like that because you're not going to get the crashes. You're going to sustain animals in that environment uh, through imported fodder or new groundwater. And that affects the system and that can cause quite dramatic patterns of land degradation which wouldn't have happened in a non-equilibrium system because you would have lost the animals, um, the grasses would regrow and you would be in that, in that cycle. So let's not pretend that we're existing in a, in a pristine environment. Of course, climate change is the other major factor that is massively having a massive impact on where things are more equilibrial or non-equilibrial. Climate change is not only affecting uh, the amount of rainfall, but crucially it's affecting its variability. And as I mentioned, it's variability that defines the difference between, uh, according to Ellis and Swift, the difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium. And as we've discussed in previous sessions, the debate on climate change is very clear. At one level, it's happening. But at another level, there's deep uncertainty. Where it's happening, to what degree, what the level of variability increases are going to be, where, etc., etc. So um, there's a lot of good work in, in all parts of the world. Uh, in Africa, uh, the work at Ilri, led by Phil Thornton and others, I think is very impressive because it tries to make use of multiple sources of climate data and think about the downscaling of that to particular places. And if you read that paper, yeah, I mean, basically the climate science tells us you have to be more responsive non-equilibrium dynamics are going to increase. Probably the areas that are covered in those earlier maps will change. Um, and living with uncertainty is, is, is basically a, a, a key starting point. The other dynamic, which again we've discussed before, is the process of landscape fragmentation through enclosures, through privatization, through fencing, affecting the degree to which the spatial patterning of ecosystems can be accessed. This is a big debate within pastoralism, but also conservation science and so on. It affects domestic animals as well as it does wildlife. Um, and it affects particularly migration and trans transhumance patterns. Um, so the basic response to non-equilibrium systems, which is flexible movement, then becomes more challenging. But the other thing is in relation to key resources, those patches I mentioned. Which areas are most often removed from, an, from a landscape for other uses? Well, it's very likely it's going to be those key resources. Uh, 
they're the valuable grazing for pastoralists, but they're also the valuable places for irrigation because there's water, for growing crops because there's better uh, soils, etc., etc. So it's not surprising what happens in these processes of enclosure and fragmentation that these sites are removed. Now, what happens when you remove a key resource from a, a wider landscape? You're in big trouble because that, as I mentioned before, is the last place where animals can go to get water and food in the end of the dry season or at the end of the winter. So the consequence is very often if you remove those key resources, not only are you physically removing I don't know, a few hundred meters squared, you're actually undermining the use of the whole of the rest of the rangeland, which could be kilometers and kilometers squared. So this is a very significant part of thinking about ecological dynamics in relation to land use. The paper I mentioned before um, was certainly the same group from Colorado, um, Kathy Galvin, Robin Reed, uh, Maria Fernandez and others, have made the case that patterns of landscape fragmentation are happening across the world and that the, you can see when you map on the degree of fragmentation, the degree of enclosure and privatization, a trend. A trend that goes towards increased fragmentation, but then reverses. Their argument is that um, at a certain point, when fragmentation becomes so extreme, which they um, point to the US rangelands as the most extreme example, there can be switches elsewhere and we see this in conservancies in the removal of fences to allow more flexible use of livestock and wildlife in certain parts of the world as well so fragmentation doesn't only go on one way although that's the dominant feature it can go in the other way go the other way as well so we have to think about how what the spatial patterning of rangelands is um, in thinking about the relationship between ecology and pastoralism so Rangeland ecology in, in uh, 27 minutes or thereabouts. Um, uh, so what does this then mean? Um, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen um, this debate evolve. I think it's become more sophisticated over time. There aren't people who wear the T-shirt, everywhere is non-equilibrium, or wear the T-shirt, everywhere is equilibrium. Some of the classic approaches to rangeland management, controlling numbers, etc., still are important, but you have to think about them in a different way. It's not just total numbers over total area. It's total numbers in relation to what resources exist. So carrying capacity has to be thought about in a different way. We have to think about spatial heterogeneity. We have to think about patches. We have to think about key resources. But the basic argument of the new range ecology, I think, still applies. The old forms of rangeland management uh, are deeply problematic and can be disruptive to systems. But we also have to think about how rangelands are changing or pastoral systems are changing and adapt our thinking accordingly. But one of the most persistent debates and that the, what the rangeland at disequilibrium or the non-equilibrium range ecology got caught up with was the perennial debate about land degradation or desertification. Do pastoralists destroy the environment? Now that's been the assumption since colonial periods and even before. The assumption is, you know, people have too many animals, they have a sort of culture bound insistence of having more and more, and the result is that the rangelands gets hammered and you have advancing deserts and desertification. You only have to read the colonial science that informed, um, informed uh, rangeland policy and, and development policy more broadly uh, from the 1920s and 30s onwards, fueled by the experience of the Dust Bowl in the United States and so on, to see that this has been a dominant narrative in thinking about dryland development. But of course, non-equilibrium uh, theory would suggest that rangelands are much more resilient because uh, the animal numbers never increase or rarely increase to the level of so-called ecological carrying capacity. They always get knocked back. Therefore, the amount of grazing 
and the, the amount of uh, animals on the land uh, should be fine. So that was the debate. Um, again, slightly unhelpfully polarized, but that's the way that it, it, it panned out. But desertification as a narrative and as a policy feature is still right out there. Um, and the trouble is a lot of people involved in this debate in international organizations and national governments haven't heard of the, new, the change of paradigm of the new range ecology. Um, they just haven't engaged with what I've been talking about up to now at all. The assumption that persists is exactly the assumption that colonial officials had in the 1920s and 30s. And unfortunately, um, out of the 1992 UN Environment Development Process, we ended up with the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, which in my view, and not everyone shares this view, and certainly not people within the UNCCD, uh, I think this was a big mistake. It created a, an institution around a myth. Um, and when you create an institution around a myth in the United Nations with money and people and, yeah. and so on behind it, you have problems. For anyone who's worked in the United Nations, I think you'll probably get the idea. So, and unlike climate change and biodiversity which were the other conventions this wasn't really a global public good question it was actually a question of land degradation in particular places for particular people and I'm not denying that land de degradation exists the point is is it constructed in the way that uh, the uh, those in the the UNCCD and others um, construct it anyway the consequence of this is that desertification and the greening of the desert and the rolling back of the Sahara and all of that is still a major policy narrative that seems to ignore all of this debate in new range ecology almost completely. Um, and the solutions tend to be completely misplaced and often fail, you know, a, a greening the desert, uh, green walls, you know, all of this stuff we see again and again. The picture on the bottom right is the, uh, the meeting in Pakistan of the, of the World Desertification Day. So it sort of replicates the whole, the performance of policy, um, replicates the problem, in my view. I think an additional dimension to this that's accelerated in the last few years where not only the assumptions about desertification have become embedded institutionally but there have been new ways of trying to address it through through markets so the idea is drawing from carbon offset schemes land degradation neutrality promoted by FAO, UNCCD, IUCN and various others um, is that you can degrade the land in one place as long as you offset it with improving the land in another place. Well, I mean, you know, you'd only have to think about the very basics of the ecology of dry land systems to, to know that this is completely ridiculous. Uh, and not only does it uh, remove the governance of rangelands to a distant market exchange, um, it, also un it also doesn't make sense uh, ecologically. But, you know, there's big momentum behind it, and it looks nice um, that you can balance everything out. There's much more debate about that, and I'm probably being rather one-sided, but uh, I can go into the discussion of the implications of it, and you can read about it in some of the references associated with this session. But... The debate about land degradation, desertification, has been running for a long time. And there is a mismatch, as I said, not only between the ecology, but also the social science thinking that has emerged around thinking about desertification. There is a very good book compiled by the now sadly late Mike Mortimer and Roy Benke uh, called The End of Desertification? Question mark which has chapters from all over the world which basically tell the same story, that the standard narrative 
as constructed in policy on desertification, whether in China, whether in India, whether in uh, Europe, whether in Africa, whether in Australia, just doesn't match up to the data and to our understandings. Not denying that there is a degradation and problems of environmental change, for sure, but the way that it's constructed just doesn't match the way that we now, scientifically, understand um, dryland ecosystems. There's a great chapter by Jeremy Swift in the book that mentioned on the slide there called The Lie of the Land, which is well worth reading at some point, uh, where he documents the history of this debate in Africa, and particularly West Africa, and the whole way that data was misused and manipulated in policy to justify a particular narrative of advancing desert, when actually the data didn't actually show that at all. Um, just last year, there was a nature paper that came out, which I thought was great, partly because it was in nature, high profile, proper science, you know, not in a sort of IDS produced book in the social sciences, um, which showed, it's a nice paper, it's very simple, and it just showed basically through historical archaeological data that it was almost certain that pastoralists prevented or delayed the expansion of the Sahara at various points. Uh, over time. So again, deploying uh, in a not non-equilibrium range ecology, not a social science critique of colonial interventions, but you know, good old archaeology and, and, and long-term analysis all point to the same story. The desertification isn't just a simple, inevitable process. And I don't know how many times I have made this case in different fora, as have many others. Um, the other uh, critique which comes out of uh, political ecology, early, this early political ecology book by Piers Blakey and Harold Brook Brookfield, Land Deg Degradation and Society, is, just makes the basic case, very obvious case, that land degradation isn't necessarily natural. It's, it depends on what you want out of a piece of land. It's socially constructed. It's, uh, so if you want annual grasses that fluctuate, that may be quite good for if they're high protein for your system if you can move around. Perennial grasses aren't necessarily the be all and end all of a grazing system. We had a discussion in a previous session about how different visions of pastoral lands are debated. It can either be extensive pastoralism or it could be filled with elephants and giraffes and so on or it could be a town. Now, moving from one to the other isn't necessarily degradation. It depends on what you want out of that system. And defining what that you want out of that system is an economic, social, and political choice, and often widely debated. So, you know, there are certain places where you can't get anything out of that system. Um, but thinking about degradation in social, political terms is crucial. So to conclude, this is all, not surprisingly, about politics and its relationship to science. The relationships between science and policy uh, are mediated by the way we tell stories about, the sci uh, about science and the world, the discourses and narratives we tell about degradation, the relationship between those discourses and narratives with the actors and networks who support particular discourses and narratives, and the power relations and politics that mean that certain narratives, no matter what the evidence is, win out. So what we've seen over decades now, despite the science of new range ecology, despite the archaeology of deserts, but despite the, uh, our understanding of, of climate variability and, and spatial patterning of, of, of rangelands, and despite our understanding of how degradation dynamics un unfold in particular places, we still have this dominant narrative of desertification and land degradation, particularly in pastoral areas. Why? It's political, of course. And it's political because it's related to powerful interests who want to sustain that narrative. So when you're thinking about science, you have to think about politics at the same time, always. We were naive in the early 1990s. We thought the evidence of the new range ecology would win out. Of course it was true. 
we've got all this data, piles of it. Jim Ellis and Co. Co had been doing this study in Turkana for 18 years. Lane had and Co. in Burana for goodness knows how many years. There was so much data. It was incontrovertible, surely. But no. Uh, paradigms change. Thomas Kuhn told us this a long time ago. Paradigms change only when the challenge is sustained and then you can move into a new form of, of normal science. And that change has happened to some degree. I mean, I was mentioning earlier on the huge number of, of theses and detailed studies that have basically proven what we knew um, in the early 80s, uh, the late 80s and early 90s. But they ne haven't necessarily found their way into the core of policy. That's much more of a, a political paradigm shift, which um, is much more challenging. So James Keeley, uh, who used to work here at IDS, and myself some years ago did a, a detailed study of thinking about policy processes around land degradation and soils, soil fertility in particular. And that book on the right up there, Understanding Environmental Policy Processes, was, re was, was the result of that. That helped us move away from a, perhaps a slightly naive position that science will always out, that science will always win. We had to understand the politics of this, and in this case around soil fertility management in Africa. There have been two recent and really excellent books that if you're interested in this debate are worth having a look at, and a very recent uh, discussion amongst a number of colleagues who, who have all contributed to this wider debate about um, ecology and people and land in uh, pastoral areas in the uh, American Association of Geographers Annals Journal. The two books are by Diana Davis and by um, Nathan Sayre, and both take a sort of policy process look at these rangeland debates. The Arid Lands book by, by Davis takes a sort of bigger global picture. Uh, Nathan Sayre's book focuses in on the debate in uh, the United States, rangeland debates in the United States, but then moves out in the latter chapters to the global debate. And both analyze in very interesting detail how science works in practice. And it ain't straightforward, and it's always political. Um, I won't go into the details of what they respectively say, but just to advertise that they're, they're the two books and the wider debate in the annals of the uh, American Association of Geographers just shows how history, power, knowledge intersect in all of this. And that any researcher starting out work and wanting to work in pastoral areas needs to be aware of that wider politics uh, in order to think about how evidence, whether it's about pastoral practices or rangeland ecology, how evidence uh, intersects with policy making. Um, and be aware of that. Good science is still important, no question. And I think the, uh, the way the debate on rangelands has moved has moved in large part because of good science, but it only moved so far because of the wider politics of the way evidence is constructed. <laughs>